Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Maureen Conway, a Vice President at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Economic Opportunities Program. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation, The Guarantee, Inside the Fight for America's Next Economy, a book talk with Natalie Foster. This conversation is part of the Economic Opportunities Program ongoing Opportunity in America discussion series in which we explore the changing state of economic opportunity in the United States, what it means for workers, businesses, and communities, and ideas for change that promote shared prosperity and race and gender equity. I'm super excited that today we not only have Natalie here to talk with us about her inspirational new book, uh, but we also have uh, the brilliant Dr. Manuel Pastor, who will provide some brief opening remarks for our discussion, and then we'll join the latter half of the discussion with Natalie. And as always, we will have time for your questions, so please keep them coming. Um, and before we dive into all of that, I just have to do a quick review of our technology. All attendees are muted. We welcome your questions. Please use the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen to submit questions. Um, we also encourage, we know we have a terrific audience, uh, lots of folks with lots of expertise in the audience. So we really encourage you to share your perspective. If you have ideas, examples, resources, experiences that you wanna share, please do so, uh, uh, share those in the chat. Uh, we always appreciate your feedback at the end of the session. Please do uh, click the survey tab on the left side of your screen and share your thoughts with us. Um, we also encourage you to uh, post on social media. Our hashtag is talk opportunity. If you have any technical issues, uh, please message us in the chat or email us at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. That's eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. This event is being recorded and we will post it to our website and share it via email um, after, this, after this event. Uh, closed captions are available for this discussion. Click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video. Um, for materials related to today's discussion, including a link to purchase Natalie's book and a list of upcoming events, uh, click the materials on the left side of your screen. Okay, so now we get to dive in. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Manuel Pastor. Dr. Pastor is a distinguished professor of sociology and American studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He currently directs the Equity Research Institute at USC. Uh, Pastor holds a doctorate in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is the inaugural holder. And alas, I didn't ask about pronunciation, uh, so I'll do my best, of the Turpangian Chair in Civil Society and Social Change at USC. Uh, Dr. Pastor's research has focused on issues of the economic, environmental, and social conditions facing low-income urban communities and the social movements seeking to change those realities. He's the author of numerous books, many of which I recommend, uh, and including most recently, Solidarity Economics, Why Mutuality and Movements Matter, co-authored with Chris Benner. So Manuel, we're so happy you're here with us today, and let me turn the mic over to you. Great. Um... Glad to be with everyone and glad that apparently the mic is now working. Adam, you can uh, shoot some panicky uh, moves in my direction if it's not, but uh, assuming it is. So uh, great to be with you. I can't tell you how excited I am about this book. Uh, and partly because of what this book is bringing to us analytically by talking about the guarantee, talking about the importance of thinking about security as well as equity, but also because this book is a remarkable personal journey. We really start with Natalie as a child, uh, living through her own uh, challenges and sometimes deprivations, being able to see the challenges that face others, finding her way to really her soulful mission of beginning to understand what it is we need to do to heal as a society from the racism and inequality that has plagued us for centuries and plagues us today and how she moved from working in uh, early digital efforts to get out the vote to working on the Obama campaign to what it is that she's doing today and along the way making so many friends who are my dear friends as well so this is a remarkable 
journey. And one of the reasons why I think that's important is because getting to something that at times seems maybe new, the idea that our society would function better with guarantees rather than with the insecurity of the market, that the whole mythos of free to choose is really just free to lose, and that our society performs suboptimally when we are terrorizing people with the level of insecurity that exists in an economy that doesn't have guaranteed income, that doesn't have guaranteed jobs, that saddles people with too much college debt, that saddles people with too much medical debt, that that's no way to run a society. Beginning to understand that as a different framework means that we as readers need to take a journey and Natalie takes us through her journey itself. So I was asked to set a little bit of context. And when I think about the moment we're in, I think about the fact that we really face three interconnected crises. One is the crisis of multiracial democracy. We haven't had it for that long. Really, it just got secured in the 60s and we've got a tenuous grip on it and people are now trying to take it away by stripping away the right to vote of so many people, just as the nation is becoming majority people of color. We've got a crisis of economic inequality where the 1% has run away from the rest of us in a fashion that is so dramatic we haven't seen it since the Gilded Age. And of course, we've got a climate crisis in which we're really cooking the planet and erasing our future. Now, the thing that connects all three of those crises is disconnection. The disconnection that uh, our society feels as we're becoming a place where every community is a minority community. The disconnection that's profoundly there when you see someone who's houseless on the street and don't think there, but for the grace of God, go I, but rather think, well, that's really just what the market delivered in terms of that person's own performance. And of course, the crisis of disconnection from Mother Earth and from future generations when we allow our planet to be in the uh, situation that it's in. And the way to address all of those crises is to create a new politics of connection. And for that, we need a new economics of connection. Now, I am an economist by training. I got my PhD in economics, but I walked away from the field because it was so hard to be in a field that denied that racism could persist. It was so hard to be in a field that valued efficiency above equity. It was so hard to be in a field that ignored the common sense that if we treat each other better, we will actually get a more productive and prosperous society. So I walked away, but in recent years, I've begun to walk back to economics, including with the book that was mentioned, Solidarity Economics. Why have I walked back and how does this book play a role? I walked back because our society began to realize and others began to realize that economics is too important to be left to economists. And it needs to be filled with sociologists, with political scientists, with activists, and with people like Natalie Foster, who just bring common sense to understanding that designing a society in which insecurity is the norm is designing a society that's bound to fail. The second reason I walk back is because there's a new generation of economists who have begun to be really interested in issues of inequality and also begun to realize that an economics of insecurity and scarcity breeds a politics of hoarding and polarization. And that that politics of hoarding and polarization of disconnection dooms us all. So I have a lot of faith in this new generation of economists who's coming forward. The third reason why I've come back is because there's a new attention to empirics in our field of economics. And that is a beauty of this book. You know, economists have generally taught that raising the minimum wage costs employment without almost any evidence at all. And we've also taught that if you guarantee people that they will not fall to the floor 
that they will not have the incentives to work. And what this book shows is that when you offer a guarantee, when you tell people there's a fallback position, that their debt will not sink them, that they will be not be left with ins uh, insufficient wages, that they begin to become more entrepreneurial, they invest in themselves and their families. And in fact, we wind up guaranteeing prosperity. And that's the other myth that's been taught in economics, that too much equity is actually going to shipwreck prosperity rather than investing in equity, reducing this level of over-incarceration, eliminating the insecurity that people uh, who are undocumented feel in a uh, broken immigration system. Uh, that beginning to invest in black and brown youth in, in schools that are been left uh, to be underinvested in, that that's not going to shipwreck our prosperity. That's going to deliver prosperity. So Natalie's book documents her own journey to these ideas. She talks about how the field has made that journey, and she talks about the friends, uh, the uh, Derek Hamilton, Solana Rice, uh, uh, Michael Tubbs, uh, Dorian Warren, Aijin Pu, who have walked with her on that journey. And most of all, she talks about the fact that we need to come back to our soul, to come back to that fundamental connection, that if we want to have strategy about what to do, we first need, need to heal ourselves and heal this rift that's existed. It's a remarkable book. It's a remarkable journey. I look forward to talking a little bit more about it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Manuel. That was perfect. It is a remarkable book and Natalie is a remarkable person. So I am so delighted now that I get to uh, uh, formally introduce Natalie. Um, uh, Natalie Foster is co-founder of the Economic Security Project, which advocates for ideas that build economic power for all Americans. She served as digital director for President Obama's Organizing for America and the Democratic National Committee. She built the first digital department at the Sierra Club and served as the deputy organizing director for MoveOn.org. Um, Natalie, I think we first met in like uh, 2014. I think you were at Peers and we were like talking about gig economy stuff. And you were thinking about, you, you know, even then you're sort of looking at that and you're going, OK, portable benefits. Like, let's think about like, how do we bring stability and security to people in their in their working lives and their economic lives and their lives? Right. Uh, so um, so I think you've just been thinking about these issues. So for so long, you're such a powerful thinker and doer. And um, and I'm just so grateful that you're here. We are grateful all at the Aspen Institute that you are also a senior fellow. Uh, with the Future of Work initiative here. Um, so thank you so much for, for writing the book and thank you for uh, joining us to talk about it today. Um, and just to kind of jump right in, uh, as I mentioned, uh, and you know, uh, you've been doing ag uh, organizing and advocacy for a while, but, um, and, and even Manuel talked about this, like this book is your story of your life, right? And so I'm wondering just to start, if you could uh, talk a little bit about you know, the things that shaped your worldview and drove you to focus on these issues, these issues, essentially this goal of economic freedom and self-determination for all, sort of what drives you for that? I will answer that, absolutely. But first, I just want to say thank you, Maureen and Matt and the team at Aspen Institute, uh, the Economic Opportunities Program for um, hosting this. It's a real honor to be here. And Dr. Pastor, uh, I really just was jotting down all of your one-liners in that um, <laughs> opening remarks session, like the freedom to choose is the freedom to lose. Um, it just makes me think so much of the corporate concentration that we're living in and your books, The State of Resistance and Solidarity Economics have been really influential to me. So it's just an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, and Maureen, <clears throat> your question is about um, how sort of what brought me here. And, you know, I grew up the daughter of a preacher. Uh, I found organizing uh, in college. And a preacher's daughter takes pretty quickly to organizing because it's all about bringing people together for shared purpose. 
and um, creating a community of people who want to see the world differently. And uh, I, I got the opportunity to hear uh, Dr. Cornell West on campus um, when I was in college. And he would say that justice is what love looks like in public. And that helped me understand that what part of what I want my mission to be is to create the justice, you know, that we believe is possible um, in this country. So I would start organizing and I would organize in a variety of ways. I'd use technology to bring people together. Um, I'd think about organizing, uh, as you point out, um, in, you know, new spaces like the then called the sharing economy and um, have over the past decade thought about how you organize around ideas and um, organize to build economic power for all Americans, regardless of race, religion, or zip code. And <clears throat> I've been heads down building the guaranteed income work, which we can talk about. And <clears throat> I, I was really reflecting on uh, Dr. Pastor's comments about economists, because it would be an economist, Derek Hamilton, who um, I would be sitting with in a room full of other economists who do exactly what Dr. Pastor was saying, you know, and it focused on the numbers and the data. And it would be Dr. Hamilton who would say, you know, what is the purpose of the economy? What is the purpose of the economy? There's like crickets in the room. He'd say, I think <laughs> it is for human flourishing, that we could create an economy would allow for and support human flourishing. And as we stand now on this precipice of the age of AI, of the many crises that Dr. Pastor laid out, that couldn't be more important than ever to uh, build an economy that supports human flourishing as well as stability for the American worker. I love that. That is fantastic. I, I love that um, purpose, focus. Um, uh, and because I feel like in those spaces, what um, uh, what Derek's doing, what you're doing, is is um, is really challenging. What you get so often in those conversations, it's no, we can't, right? And you're sort of saying, yes, we can, yes, yes, we can. Um, but anyway. We will get to that in a moment. Uh, I really did want to ask you, like, so I asked you sort of what what drives you personally, but also, you know, with your organizer, strategizer, as you always are doing, uh, uh, why this book, why now, right? So why was it important to kind of um, get it all into a book and, and why is now the right time? Well, I think now is the right time because it has become more clear than ever that the last 50 years of economic policymaking haven't worked for most people. And we live in the, the aftermath of that, right? We know that 25% of Americans have nothing saved for retirement, right? We know that four out of 10 of us can't pull together $400 in, a, in an emergency if we needed to. Americans are overworked, stressed out, and our democracy is on the brink. All of that is exacerbated along racial lines as communities of color disproportionately bear the brunt of this economy that is not working for most people. So I think now is the time because that is widespread consensus. And that wasn't true for most of my life. There was a different consensus. The consensus for my lifetime was that actually we should have total faith in the market zero faith in government, and people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. That was the economic orthodoxy of the time. And it was assumed to be like the weather, right? Like something that we can't change. So we just have to put up a bigger umbrella. But I, that has changed over the many years, uh, over the last few years. I think that really has changed since the 2008 financial crisis, when we saw 10 million homes lost and we saw Black and Latino families lose half of their collective wealth overnight. And we saw the government support the banks, but not the everyday people. And that really uh, has precipitated something different. I would also say it's not only that we can do uh, this, but that it's already starting to happen. Part of what I've been very inspired by is the proof of concept of a guarantee economy that I see being built across the country 
often piloted in cities and states, but actually now happening at the federal level um, where we're guaranteeing things. I'm talking housing, healthcare, homes, um, the basics that we need to live a life of dignity and freedom and self-determination, um, as, as you said, Maureen. That's beautiful. Um, so you are... Uh... Um, an expert uh, in guaranteed income. And we're talking about guaranteed income. Um, and, you know, you and I have talked about this over the years, and you've really uh, very much influenced how I think about uh, guaranteed income and what it can do and what it can mean for, for people. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm wondering if your thoughts, like how you think about guaranteed income and what it can do and what it can mean for people has changed over time. And if you could, if you could just talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, I think one of the biggest changes is that it is real. It is possible and it is right here. So let me tell you a quick story um, uh, over the last, you know, eight to nine years. You know, there was a student um, at Stanford University sitting in the library reading Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s last book. He would take notes in the margins. And that student was Michael Tubbs. He would take that dog-eared book of his to Stockton, where he would become the youngest mayor in American history. And he would take an idea that Dr. King talked about in his final book, a guaranteed minimum income. And he would demonstrate what it would look like if the United States took this guarantee seriously. And he would give $500 a month to 125 families with no strings attached. My team and I at the Economic Security Project were really honored to work with him on that. Around the same time in Jackson, Mississippi, you have Dr. Aisha Yandaro building in uh, the Magnolia Mothers Trust, which gave $1,000 a month to Black women in Jackson to build lives of economic resilience. And so these pilots started to get noticed, right? And media came in to Stockton and Jackson and um, Aisha and Michael started getting texts saying, hey, I want that in my city. And they open sourced their playbook. They invited others in and we saw it replicate to 12 cities, 30 cities, 100 cities, all demonstrating what this guarantee would look like. We're up to 140 pilots now around the country. And then when the pandemic hit, lawmakers would reach for a tool that was already tried and tested. They would send stimulus checks to families. They would pass the expanded child tax credit, which is a guaranteed income for families mm -hmm. with young children. If you have two young children, for example, mm -hmm. that's essentially $500 a month with no strings attached that was sent to bank accounts of parents across America. So that was just it was like political warp speed <laughs> to have an idea be reintroduced back into um, circulation and move into the mainstream, right? And so as I put my head up, you know, part of this book is realizing it's not just guaranteed income, that it's the guarantee of housing, of health care, of family care, of uh, college. All of these are have moved into the mainstream and we've seen glimmers of what it would look like at the federal um, level, le leading us to believe that this is possible uh, in the United States. So I think that's one answer to your question, which is how I've moved on it. <clears throat> and I think the second um, answer is just really, it's in the title um, that I chose for the book of the guarantee, that that was the most fundamental aspect of it. And, you know, we may start by targeting who gets it. Um, in the case of the child tax credit, it's parents with children. It may be targeted by income, that that is okay as long as it is guaranteed with no strings attached each, each month. And that has been one of the shifts that, that I've made and leads me to really be supportive and excited about the guaranteed income movement around the country. Yeah, that's really great. I want to bring in a question that came in from our audience around this, because I think, you know, that idea of a guarantee has really shown its power and effectiveness in giving people confidence um, in their ability to uh, participate in the economy and, and sort of, you know, have more agency and freedom in their lives. Um, 
And uh, but there's been some backlash, right? And so there's a question about, you know, sort of what your take is on moves to ban guaranteed income programs and and how we should kind of respond when these sort of big ideas are so staunchly opposed by um, by by people who would even oppose non-controversial ideas like giving kids free lunch. So. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting to talk about the progress that we've made at a moment where we're also feeling and seeing and experiencing so much being rolled back, right, of our freedoms um, and, and other things we take um, very seriously. And so, you know, I, I think we have to both hold the progress and the size of the problem at the same time. And that can sometimes be a real challenge. Um, on the guaranteed income front, you know, there are now four states that have um, passed preemption bills basically banning um, pilots from using public dollars of in in cities in those states. And I, I actually think it's it's how you know this idea is serious is because the, it, the those who want to oppose progress are spending time and energy and money to try and ban it. But you can't actually ban an idea whose time has come. So I, I see a lot of fight back and pushback um, in those states, and I think that will grow. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, I want to switch back to something you were starting to bring up in in the last part. You know, the guarantee, as you were saying, it's there's guaranteed income, but there's other ways to shape it and other types of guarantees that you can have. It can be housing. It can be healthcare. Um, so for folks who haven't read the book, can you sort of just briefly note the range of guarantees uh, that you that you touch on? And then, you know, when we were talking before this um, before this conversation, you know, I was saying, what do you think is the like most meaningful? And you kind of went right to housing. So maybe you could also say why you think that one is sort of like the fundamental bedrock one. Yeah. Um you know, in the last few years, we've seen meaningful momentum on all seven. I trace seven in the book. Now, I'm not suggesting the guarantee economy is limited to those seven. I just found very meaningful um, progress on the seven guarantees that I that I tracked. So it's housing, it's the guarantee of income, healthcare, family care, uh, good work, college, and uh, an inheritance also known um, colloquially as a baby bond. And yeah, you know, I live in California and um, my kid is 11. And over the last 11 years, we've seen the housing crisis explode in every uh, corner of our state. And I think we're seeing that in cities across this country. What used to be invisible um, poverty and insecurity is now widely visible in streets across this country. And so I do think housing is one of the most important ones. And it is something uh, that we've left entirely up to the private market for decades. And um, I, there is a shift underfoot to uh, around that, that saying the market has failed us uh, in so many ways. And um, we're starting to see more um, argument toward a guarantee of housing. You know, I, I tracked Tara Raguvir in Kansas City, who uh, was a researcher actually with Matthew Desmond, and then um, started organizing tenants, built the Kansas City Tenants Union, and is now um, going to launch a federation of tenants unions around the country. And she was the first to articulate the homes guarantee being an umbrella that would hold so many of the um, different parts of housing, right? From evictions to rental assistance, to protecting renters, to affordability, right? It could all be wrapped up in um, the housing guarantee. And, you know, I think there there's really three parts to housing. One is to protect renters and tenants who are the most vulnerable in the housing market. But two is to produce more units. We just haven't built in this country market rate or affordable housing for decades. And so we need to be building more. And the third is to preserve the affordable housing, you know, that we do have um, in this country. And one place where we're starting to see kind of all of these uh, come together is in Montgomery County, Maryland. And uh, the Housing Authority in Montgomery County, Maryland has now built over 1,000 units, and there are thousands more planned that are kept permanently off the speculative market. 
They are for middle income Marylanders. They're built on the transit line. Uh, one that they're going to break ground on, one building that they're going to break ground on this month is actually a carbon neutral um, uh, building. And uh, it means that rent will be stable and people aren't kicked out of the units if they end up getting a better paying job, right? Or if uh, something happens uh, in their life and they lose their job, that, that the, the units are there and people can count on that housing. And housing authorities across the country are starting to take note of what's happening in Montgomery County, Maryland. So I, I leave that as one example of where we're starting to see the guarantee take shape. Great, thank you so much. Um, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, so I'm very excited about that. Um, one, uh, I wanted to dig in a little bit on the good work side. You know, this is a big interest of mine. Um, uh, so, you know, and I think that like we have seen people trying to guarantee jobs like back in the welfare reform days, there was some effort to make people work for benefits and sort of there would be a public job people could do. Um, but you know that sort of uh, guaranteeing a job is a far cry from guaranteeing good work guaranteeing good jobs that provide sort of basic economic stability, opportunities to grow, a safe and dignified workplace. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering how you see sort of the guarantee to good work play out and how you see this idea of guarantees kind of influence people's ability to find good jobs or to create their own good jobs. Um, so where do you see progress on that front? Yeah, I think that's a great question. It's really, I've been, I've learned so much, honestly, from you, Maureen, and the work that Aspen has put out over the years on this question of work and good work. You you bring up sort of work requirements, and I think that that is an entirely different thing. And um, I want to point folks to the Maven Collaborative's uh, report, very aptly titled, Work Requirements Are Trash. <laughs> <laughs> to point out why that's that's really a very different thing um, designed to um, hold people back. But what I know and what we are seeing about guarantee with guarantees is that we invest in families and we invest in communities. The people have the agency they need, the time and space and resources in their life to find meaningful work, um, work that pays more, work that perhaps ends at three o'clock so you can pick up your kid or allows you to just have one job in this country, right? That one job would be enough to put food on the table and pay the rent. That that's the type of good work, you know, that that we um, need. And the other thing we know is that when we invest in people, that it functions like a trampoline, um, not a safety net. Venture capitalist Roy Bahat framed this up, that it's not just a net that holds people, Right, but it's a trampoline that allows them to jump back and find you know, the thing they're excited about and their potential. And we actually saw this pay out, play out in the pandemic uh, for decades, right? Small business creation has gone down in America as corporate consolidation has grown, as monopolies have grown, it's gotten harder than ever to start a small business and people don't, right? They're working two to three jobs to put food on the table. In 2021, and in 2022, we saw a 24% increase in small business creation, the first time we've seen that trend reverse. And I think it's because people had money in their pockets and they had just a little bit of a nest egg to be able to go out and start their own business. So that also is a part of the work question and, and how work and investment are connected. Yeah, that's great. Um, I wanna bring my Manuel back now. Um, and, uh, because, uh, he's been thinking and writing about related ideas and where I wanted to go next was to talk about this, um, fundamentally, really, I think a different view of government that you put out here. And I think one of the things I've sort of just been reflecting on is, you know, you both kind of mentioned this issue of like what the ideas were, you know, 30, 40 years ago about the economy and how it works and also what the role of government is or should be in a successful economy. Uh, you know, really, we had this idea that government shouldn't do anything in the economy, right? That it should just stay out of the way. Um, and I think that the guarantee really fundamentally challenges that notion and puts forth the idea of government as a force for good in people's lives, as uh, as 
a way to protect freedom, right? And part of protecting freedom is giving people the freedom to do things, right? And you can't do that if they don't have any resources or ability to to make choose. So I think I think the view you're you're working with is so is so different. And I think Manuel was also sort of talking about a different thing in in the um in the in his writing in State of Resistance in particular, I was thinking about how he talked about what government had done in California and then what it could potentially do again. Um, so, so anyway, I just wanted you to both think about that a little bit and um, and and um, talk about sort of how you are, um, you know, thinking about reinvigorating, just just basically reinvigorating this belief that government action can make our lives better. Um, and Natalie, I'll I'll let you kind of go first. Yeah, I I think that's exactly right. It's a new story that says government has a responsibility for guaranteeing, you know, basic economic rights for everyone, regardless of race, religion, and zip code. And that is a fundamentally different story than the one that we were told for so long and that we're seeing government, you know, do that um, across the board. Now, it also means that it has to work, right? And I feel like there's two stories uh, in this particular moment. One is the story of FAFSA, where students are entering college this fall not knowing what their student aid is going to look like because our FAFSA uh, situation um, was was dismal, right? So government has to work for people. At the same time, we rolled out direct file from the IRS, which is a free and fair filing tool that the IRS rolled out and it worked beautifully. You probably didn't read about it because when it doesn't work, there aren't, head when it works well, there aren't headlines, you know, about it, but it sits as an alternative to uh, tax filing preparation um, that is charged, right? That charges people and it saved people millions of dollars and um, a lot of time uh, to just file taxes for free. And so those are, two examples of, of of where we see you know government working in people's lives and not working and knowing we need to make sure that it that it can yeah manuel i'd be interested in your thoughts on this one so i think those are important points like any academic i'm going to kind of take a detour uh to the to the question i really want to answer uh but it's related which is i think that the what goes on is that conservatives have for any problem offer the solution of the market. Uh, that is, if there's uh, unemployment, but the wages fall, the market will take care of it. If there's insufficient housing, free the markets, it'll get produced. Even uh, if there's an environmental challenge, let's use markets, cap and trade, to resolve the problem. Quite often, the left uh, will respond instead with the government, that the government needs to address racial discrimination, and it does, that the government needs to provide housing, and it does, and certainly that the government needs to constrain uh, corporate uh, pollution and protect our environment. But I think that what we argued for in solidarity economics, and I think what's behind what Natalie is saying, is that rather than turning to the market or to the government, we need to turn to each other. We need to understand the mutuality that brings us all together and how the government can be an instrument of that. And that's why democracy is actually so important. You know, when you tell particularly communities of color that have long been left behind and kept behind that the government is here to save them, the same government that over-policed, the same government that put redlining in place, the same government that uh, underinvests in schools in your neighborhood, the government's gonna do it. It's a little bit like the reaction that happened during COVID when the government showed up, rightly so, with vaccines first in communities of color. And people were like, well, wait a minute, you've been neglecting us, why are you showing up now? So beneath the idea of government has to be democracy, social movements, and mutuality, bringing our communities together so that we can actually trust that the government is here for us. And then the point that Natalie is making is that the government actually has to deliver. Now, Obamacare is popular. Imagine how popular it would have been if the website had worked the first day. Um, so we need to be thinking about effectiveness. We also need to be thinking about how do we invest in social movements, community building, 
bridge building so people trust each other so they can trust the government. Yeah, yeah. that's that's great. And I think, you know, I think that's exactly like people have to start to believe that the government is not some separate force that if it if we really have a democracy then the government is is us right um so um i i want to uh bring in another question from the audience um because i think it uh, also fits in nicely in this place um, a number of folks are asking do you think that there should be a guarantee um for reparations for black americans um and and how do you think about that within this this framework um so natalie do you want to Take that on first. Sure. And then I'd love to hear what Dr. Pastor says. Yes, I think there should be. Uh, and I think there's a lot of progress made. I mean, that reparations is a great example of something that has really moved into the mainstream in a meaningful way. And I think there's two parts to it, right? There's the tr truth and reconciliation, the healing that has to happen, but there's also the material payments that should be paid out. Um, in California, there is a commission uh, that the the state has created to really look at um, reparations and how it would happen in California. And I just heard a report back on it and was very heartened by um, the reparative um, ideas that people are putting forward. And so, yes, I think that is um, exactly the type of guarantee that could move forward um, if we had a paradigm of guaranteeing uh, in this country. Manuel? Well, first, concretely, that would be a very important step toward dealing with the persistent wealth inequality that exists in the United States. I want to highlight one other thing, particularly about the California example. If you look at the reports that were done as part of the California Reparations Commission, I think the executive summary is like 200 pages and the actual reports like 1400. This commission was definitely an overachiever. But one of the things that I think is really important about it is that the commission's report points out that slavery was not an important feature of California. It certainly, uh, there were some slaves that were part of California's uh, history uh, because they were transported from other states. But what they do is carefully trace the history of redlining, the history of labor market discrimination, the history of asset stripping, the history of placing toxic uses in black communities and other communities of color. That is that much of the reparations debate gets snagged in what does this have to do with slavery that happened a long time ago. By the way, the effects of slavery persist today, but I think the brilliance of that report is tracing it through all sorts of policies that persisted way after slavery and certainly impacted the ability to accumulate wealth and the kinds of cushions or guarantees that can be often privately provided when you've got a society that handed out benefits in a particular way. So I think it's really, really important to shift the reparations debate. So we're talking about stuff that happened in the 19th century and before, but also stuff that happened in the 20th century. And if you look at Cancer Alley in Louisiana, stuff that's happening right now that is stripping the fundamental uh, wealth of communities, both in terms of diminished property values from cancer causing pollutions nearby, and also from people's health and ability to survive. We need to make this debate alive. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I wanted to also ask you both, um, you know, Natalie, in your book, you highlight all of these great leaders and organizers. You've mentioned a few of them. And and Manuel, I know you have also like talked a lot about, you know, different social movements and the folks who lead them and how they show up for each other. Um, and so I, I, Manuel, maybe I'll let you start first this time just to mix it up a bit. But, you know, I'm wondering sort of like who really kind of stands out for you as you think about the, you know, activism, organizing, creating change and, and, and what you've learned from them. Gosh, I've learned everything from them. I've, you know, often said that the work that we do at the Equity Research Institute, which I had, is that we listen to organizers 
and then we add a few footnotes so that it seems more academic and established along the way. But what I'd like to do is detour just a little bit, comes back to this point, uh, to talk a second about my uh, son, who's a musician uh, who actually started as an actor. He went to theater school at UCLA. This is the kind of career choice that does make a parent nervous, particularly a parent that grew up in working class settings and doesn't, you know, didn't have a private cushion. You kind of worry what's going to happen with your kid. So one day I was sitting with my son, Joaquin, and I said to him, uh, Joaquin, it was a very intimate uh, male conversation, which means we weren't looking at each other. We were looking at the sun setting. And I said, Joaquin, uh, you know, why are you going to theater school? What is it that you want to do with your life? And he said, um, I want to make things of beauty with my friends. And what I have found is that when you work with these movement organizers who get highlighted at Dorian Warren and Aijin Poo at Deepak Bhargava and Anthony Thigpen, so many names, Saru Jayaram and uh, Kent Wong, Linda Sarsour, so many names that I'm uh, forgetting at this point, that what you're really doing is pursuing the goal of making a world of beauty with your friends, making a community of people who are committed to change and who are committed to creating a movement that is beautiful, that yields a world that actually generates beauty and joy for all of those, all of us who are in it. You know, I'm reminded of our good friend, someone who's an inspiration to both our books, uh, Heather McGee. It was a beautiful book. Uh, both of us quote from significantly the some of us. And really what she's trying to point out in there is that we have an economy that has traditionally been designed for some of us. But what would it be if we took that and instead designed an economy for the some of us, for all of us to be able to benefit? And the only way you're going to do that, the only way you're going to create a world of beauty is with your friends. And that means listening carefully to these inspirational leaders who I think Natalie will agree, uh, what's on the pages of your book are ideas you might have come up with just a little bit, but it's really just that you are listening to the people that inspire me and the people that have inspired you. Yeah, that's. I think that's exactly right. Uh, I want to make things that are beautiful with my friends. Um, feels like a real life goal um, and wisdom from your son. So thank you for sharing that. And it actually reminds me, one of the things I read as I was putting this together was this concept of hope punk. And what this is saying is, you know, a lot of the stories we tell are grim, dark, they're dystopic and um, humans are petty and greedy. And the opposite of that is noble bright, where there's a hero who comes in and saves the day. Sometimes they have superpowers. Neither of those things are how change really happens, that it's done in a hope punk way, which is community coming together, building bonds, connecting, focused, stubborn, persistently focused on change, but knowing that there are sometimes um, moments where you don't go as fast as you want, you have to take a step back, there's a negotiation you have to make, that it's not perfect. And so I carry that idea into hope punk uh, economics, uh, the idea of hope punk economics being the way we're seeing these guarantees actually brought forward in the world. And it is precisely the work of so many of those you name, um, including people like Adi Barkan, who would spend the final years of his life fighting for a healthcare guarantee as, uh, alongside his co-founder, Jamila Headley, who now runs Be a Hero. Um, and just his life being such an inspiration um, in what it would mean to create a healthcare guarantee um, in this country, but his life also being part of saying it is about every one of us who lays awake at night, worried how we're going to pay the bills from the hospital, knowing that we live in the richest nation on earth and it doesn't have to be this way. Yeah, that's really great. Um, I, I, I'm still like loving the idea of creating things of beauty with your friends is how to think about a career. Ah, that's wonderful. Um, 
I want to switch a little bit back to guaranteed income, but I think this creates this follows on the hope punk idea, Natalie. So um, because there's the question uh, from the audience of um, uh, what have you found to be the most compelling arguments for guiding people to support guaranteed income initiatives? So do you have like a hope punk messaging campaign? Yeah, well, I think one thing we're finding is that one place we can all agree is that um, is the ideas of freedom and agency and dignity and and presence, the ability to spend time with people we love, uh, to make things of beauty with friends. And um, I think freedom is something I've actually been thinking a lot about. You know, my book shares a book birthday with Nobel Prize laureate Joseph Stieglitz's new book. It's called The Road to Freedom. It's a play on the road to serfdom, which is one of the trickle down economic sort of early texts. And uh, The Road to Freedom talks about the freedom, right? Picking up on FDR's freedom from fear, freedom from want, and talks about the way in which true freedom is impossible when there's deep economic insecurity and precarity. Now, Mia Birdsong uh, out of Oakland, who runs uh, Next River, um, a, a new uh, organization focused on practicing the future, she's been reimagining an interconnected freedom um, for this multiracial democracy that we are trying to build and how it is about coming together, not the individual notion of freedom um, that I think has so often been um, you know what we've what we've held up, and so those two thinkers have really pushed me to think more about um, what it would mean when people have economic security and what freedom um, freedom to spend time with their families, freedom to build community. You know, it, I was thinking a lot about that, um, Dr. Pastor, as you were pushing us to think yes about government, but also about us. Right when our basic needs are met, we are able to connect with one another, be more civically engaged participate more in democracy um so that's that's one of the places i think that is really important is that people deserve you know the the ability to uh, take care of their families and build lives of dignity great um there's another question from the audience uh about you know sort of now that we see that guaranteed income pilots work um how do we move beyond pilots to to scale um What's what's that? What's what could that look like? Well, I can take that one too, and then I'd love to hear, you know, Dr. Pastor, some of your reflections on just how you, you know, take how, where else we've seen things go from pilots to policy. But I would argue that um, we know exactly how to do it now, and we saw it in the expanded child tax credit. Right for six months, that was the law of the land. The IRS moved quickly, immediately after Congress passed the bill to start moving checks into parents' bank accounts to help parents with the rising cost of living and to guarantee that check, you know, that would come in each month and just a, a beginning of economic security. So I think that is one step in how you would pass a guaranteed income, but ultimately it's, it's policy. Policy is the way you scale this idea that's being demonstrated across the country. And I don't think anybody believes that, you know, the demonstrations are the end. They're just the beginning. They are here to sort of show us the way to say, this is what it would look like. This is the data we get. People are less stressed. They are healthier. They go to the doctor more often. They find work at higher rates um, and are able to sock away a little bit each month. That is the results we're seeing over and over from cities across the country that are um, running guaranteed income demonstrations. What I would add to that um, is that, you know, too often we think that a national strategy is a federal strategy. That is something we'll do in DC. And in fact, Quite often, what you need to do is instead continue to build at a locality and state level and bubble that up to national policy. So I think we're going to get an era of bigger and more comprehensive pilots, a little bit like we did with the living wage laws, a little bit like we did 
with the minimum wage gains that sort of started at cities that went to states and demonstrated that the ill effects that many economists were predicting weren't uh, really happening. I think we have seen a lot of that also with shifting uh, attitudes toward uh, immigrants, particularly undocumented immigrants uh, within our uh, communities. The one thing I think we can't avoid is that ultimately part of this comes up, uh, how do we pay for it? And we're a very wealthy society, we can pay for it. And actually also the security that it generates leads people to be more entrepreneurial, to take more chances in the labor market, to be able to get a little bit more education, to be able to have more secure housing and not be trying to go to work while you're living in a car. And all of that actually will contribute to GDP growth. And that's something we need to be lifting up, the gains that can happen to all of us from these guarantees. But inevitably, we're also going to have to cross the issue of taxation. And the fact that we've created a tax system that systematically has created extraordinary benefits for the top 1% going down to the you know, top 5% and actually put much of the tax burden in the middle. And we really do need to understand that those who are wealthy have gained from the public infrastructure, from our uh, community investments, from a stable society and to those who much is given, much is expected. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm looking at the time and I realize we don't have a lot of time left. So I wanted to ask you each kind of one final question. Um, Natalie, I'm wishing I had your book actually right in front of me and maybe you do because the last paragraph of your book, yeah, hold it up, let everybody see the cover. Um, you know, in the very last paragraph, you talk about sort of um, the imagination to believe. And sometimes I think, you know, like some of the questions we've gotten is sort of like, how do you convince other people that this works and, and that, you know, things can be better and so on. But I think also sometimes there's a question for ourselves, like how do we convince ourselves? How do we like hold on to that vision ourselves so that we can we can drive it forward? So I wanted to ask you both just like, what would be your final words of advice for, for our wonderful audience about how to hold on to that vision for themselves and keep their own inspiration for driving forward? Um, Natalie, do that's, you want to start? Yeah, that's such an excellent question, um, Maureen. You know, I think um, one part of it is really um, acknowledging that, that so much of what's happening around us is unprecedented and it breaks with the policymaking of the last 50 years, right? We would have been laughed out of the room with the idea of abolishing student debt uh, in uh, you know, the Obama administration in which I worked. And it is now a Rose Garden event in the Biden administration. It is saying government has a role. We would pass you know, a moratorium for years where no one paid back student debt during the great crisis of the pandemic. And then government would just abolish debt, billions of dollars, for students around this country. And so that is the, that is a new story and, and gets us closer to the idea of you know, debt-free higher education. And then that is happening around us now. It's also happening at the same time uh, that our freedoms are being rolled back and that democracy is right on the brink. And so I think it is so important that we have to believe what it is possible we can build in this country, that there is proof of concept here that there are advocates and activists who have been laying the groundwork so that in a moment, in a crisis that would come, ideas would be picked up and they would be moved forward at the federal level in a way that would break with, you know, the policymaking of the past. So that's the story that I think it's important to hold. That's really what's at stake this year. Um, and I'll leave I'll, with the final um, words that have been really meaningful to me. Uh, advocate Mariama Kaba says, hope is a discipline. Hope is a discipline. So some days it doesn't just come naturally and some days it feels even harder than ever, but that it's a discipline we cultivate so we can leave a better life for our kids. Yeah. And well? Well, my kids give me hope. I already shared with my 
sunset. My daughter's equally inspirational. One other thing that gives me hope is when academics like myself realize that they don't need to repeat uh, what was brilliantly said by their colleague. So all I really want to say is uh, ditto, off stage, on time. Thank you for writing this book, Natalie. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you all of us for all of you for joining us today. Uh, many, many thanks to my colleagues at the Economic Opportunities Program for helping and supporting today's event. Uh, and uh, please do take a moment to respond to our quick feedback survey, which you can find in the on, in one of the tabs on your screen. Uh, you can also send us an email at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. Let us know what you think. Uh, we always love to hear from you. Uh, we have a number of great events coming up over the next couple of months, which you can register for on the feedback uh, survey. Uh, the next step is the workers behind our groceries, a book talk with Benjamin Lohr, author of The Secret Life of Groceries. That'll be on June 21st, and we're doing that in partnership with our colleagues and the Food and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. Um, we also have uh, two events coming up as part of our Job Quality in Practice series. Uh, one is Tapping into Worker Voice to Improve Job Quality, Lessons from the Talent Pipeline Management Network on July 24th in partnership with the U.S. Chamber Foundation. And uh, the next after that is Seizing the, Mo the Moment on Worker Rights, a toolkit for organizers and practitioners on September 4th in partnership with Workshop. So uh, please join us for those, and we hope to see you again. Thank you.